So our program tonight is titled The History of Immigration in Eudora and Douglas County. Immigration has been basically the theme that we've looked at in the museum all year. And um, it's a timely topic because it seems like it's continuously in the news. And most of our programs this year have focused on immigration, as have our social media posts. And tonight's program is the conclusion of our focus on this theme. The reason we have focused on the theme of immigration this year is because of a traveling exhibit that was developed on the topic. Jan Schuper Ayrick, who's here tonight, uh, the project coordinator for the Douglas County Heritage Conservation Council, was the driving force behind the creation of the exhibit, Douglas County Pressures of Migration and Politics. And this uh, exhibit focuses on the history of immigration in Douglas County, including Eudora. And uh, it was developed with support from Freedom's Frontier, Douglas County, and the Kansas Humanities Council. And uh, the exhibit's traveling to different museums in the county. We currently have it. It's going to be at our museum through the end of 2018. So be sure to see it while we have it. Cindy and Jan and myself are going to uh, deliver tonight's program. Uh, Jan has done a lot of great work for our museum and all museums in the county. Uh, she has brought together all the history museums in the county pretty, pretty much for the first time. And we're closer now than we've ever been. And Cindy Higgins is a uh, longtime Eudora resident. She's a very talented historian when it comes to many topics, but she's especially done a lot of work on the history of Eudora. She wrote the 2007 book on the history of Eudora, and she also maintains a website. And um, those are excellent resources that get used by myself and by the public all the time. And so very grateful that she does that. And uh, that's my introduction. First Cindy's going to go, then Jan will go, and then I'll go. So, And then you guys will go. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Cindy Higgins. I'm going to turn off the light. Okay. I'm the warm up act. I'm going to be here just for a little teeny bit. Um, I'm here because I worked with Jan on the exhibit, and Jan strongly encouraged me to be here tonight. So I'm the warm-up, and um, I think what I want to do is just give you all a big picture of migration, or maybe different ways to look at migration. And I'm just going to see if the technology works here. Thank God. Okay, so um, here we are in the United States, and today most of migration is economic. You move for a job. But if you look at this, other parts of the world, South America, Central America, Northern Africa, Middle East, a lot of those people are migrating just to stay alive. And historians, you know, pretty much, well, they don't usually agree, but a lot of them do agree that there's been three large-scale migrations. And those were when everybody came from Northern Europe, and they came to the colonies, and they established them in the early 1600s, and then up into the um, American Revolutionary War, people kept coming and it kept getting bigger and then they started moving westward. And you really see this in the second large migration, which is in the mid-1800s. Everybody's moving west. And the third migration isn't really moving around the country so much, it's moving from the farm to the city. And that happened in the late 1800s into the early 1900s. So those are these three large migrations. And a lot of those people who came here to the colonies, they came voluntarily. They wanted to come. But then there were also those people that came involuntary. They might have been prisoners in English prison, pr might have been prisoners in English prisons, you know, African Americans who came here on ships. It wasn't their idea. They had to come. And then there were the in-between people, the people that were living in environments that were hostile. You know, it could have been a war that they didn't want to be involved in, or they supported the wrong wannabe ruler, and so that they had to flee when their ruler left. And I work in Topeka for the state government, and boy, there's a lot of fleeing going on right now. <laughs> you know, so, um, but a lot of migration is about politics, and politics is about power. And when you have power, there's some group that has it and another group who does not. And we see this in, in, with the American Indians because there were those who came to the United States and then those to whom the United <coughs> States came. You know, when the settlers came in, they pretty much wiped out a lot of the American tribes. You know, they did it through war, but you know, a lot through disease, particularly smallpox. And the ones that were left had to keep moving west. They were refugees within their own country. 
And so here we get to, there's your door right over there, the 1830 Indian Removal Act. So 25 tribes were told that they had to go to this horrendous, inhospitable place, which later turned out to be Northeast Kansas, which later turned out to be marvelous. So then they were shipped down to Oklahoma. And I don't know if anybody's here from Oklahoma, but I would think that they were grateful to stay in Kansas. Um, so in 1854, we get federal legislation, which is a form of politics and power. And that legislation sparked a fight for power. And it was a win at any cost mentality. And that was the 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Act, which said settlers can come in and they can decide whether Kansas will be a slave state or not. And when those settlers came, it was a stampede. You know, it was actually fascinating. We're here in this area that is very desirable. It's right over the state line. And the people came in like crazy, which is not like other states, which were a tad bit more refined. And in Kansas, you guys know how the story goes, we become a state in 1861. And if you're living here around Eudora, you might think a lot of the people were foreign born. But actually, in Kansas, it was really only about 10% at the time. But if you were living here in this area, you probably saw a lot of people from Missouri. The next door neighbors came over during this time. And I don't think they really were born there and grew up there. It was all part of this hip hopping that was going across the United States at the time. Everybody kept moving to the West. And so this is um, Ernst Ravenstein. And he was a theorist in 1885 who came up with the laws of migration. And so it wasn't unusual that people came from Missouri because he said most migrants only go a short distance. And these are some of his other theories that made sense at the time. I don't know how much they are now. But I do like categorizing uh, migration. So here's lots of different ways you can categorize um, migration. And we're going to look at a couple of ways that it happened here. For example, the Shawnee who came here from Ohio was all part of that 1830 Indian Removal Act there was an involuntary migration. It wasn't really their idea. They were pushed here. And then accompanying them were the missionaries, because they followed them. And that was more chain migration, because you get a missionary who comes here. People follow the missionaries. Over there in Baldwin, you know, they set up the college there. So we see chain migration. And then we get another example of chain migration are town companies. The town of Eudora was a town company. So was LeCompton, and so was Lawrence. And this was a group of people that decided to start a town. And once they were there, they had the nucleus. Other people joined them. And then when you have Lawrence, you have the activists and advocates. You know, these were the people from New England that just came to support an ideal. And that was a free state. And if you think about it, that's fascinating. I mean, would you get up and move to go support something that you feel strongly about? Yes, you might go vote for something, but if you said, hey, if you move to Utah, you know, and you can support the people there who are for gun control or against it, would you do it? You know, would you do it for a couple of years? Would you do it for your whole life? So I don't know about you all. Is there any issue that you would get up and move for? Just raise your hand. I'm not going to ask what it is. <laughs> all right, is there any issue you guys would vote for? Yes. <laughs> you know, if you think about it, it's a continuum. You know, voting actually seems easy when you think about actually getting up and moving. And that's what happened in the Lawrence for the activists. And then impelled migration. That's a little bit more forceful than involuntary. It's more legal. And we see that over there when the federal government wanted to build, you know, Clinton Lake. The people that were there were forced to move because they needed the land which is kind of similar to what happened at the Sunflower Ammunition Plant. The people had to move. They had to give up their land. But so many people came in, you know, at that time. And if, you might argue that, well, Eudora was settled by Germans. I would say that this is one of the dominant factors of Eudora's personality. It was the people that came in to Sunflower Ammunition Plant because a lot of those was external migration. They weren't from Kansas. They were coming from other states particularly Missouri and Arkansas. And another thing that I think kind of defines Eudora's popularity is this housing boom. It started in the 1990s. You know, it keeps going up and up. And if you were here last January, part of Ben's migration series, you know, the speaker then, he also talked about this housing boom. And it's just going to keep getting more and more. I think that defines Eudora's personality a lot. So when you listen to these, to listen to Jan and Ben, I want you all to think, 
Oh, sorry, I'm not ahead of myself. Okay, <laughs> seasonal migration. Seasonal migration, we see that now, I think, with the KU students. I know that when I go into Lawrence, the traffic gets a lot busier, you know, in August, and it's a lot nicer in the summer, you know, but we also see they come, and a lot of them stay. And when I've been going over to Lawrence, I keep meeting people who said, I went to KU, and now I've come back to live. I don't really see them in Eudora, but I do see that a lot in Lawrence. So we have seasonal migration that's going on. So now, this is what I want you all to think about. The next speakers, you know, how does our past define our personality today? And that's about all I have, because Jan is up right now. So, Jim, I'm going to give you my pointer. This is the power pointer. Okay, and I'm scooting back. Hello. I'm going to move this, because I don't want to stand in front of you. As, the, um, as an occupation, I have been employed by, the, by Douglas County as the Heritage Coordinator uh, for the last several years, and I'm a newbie to Kansas. I migrated here with my husband, Bill, who's back here, um, because we wanted a warmer climate than Chicago. We wanted a good basketball town, <laughs> and we had family. Um, my brother and his family um, are in Lawrence and have been for 30 years. So that's what brought us here. Uh, but it's been my privilege to get to know um, the historical societies around the county and to work with Ben, who is doing a fabulous job for you. I hope you all appreciate all the work that Ben does. Mm -hmm. It's very, very important. And so, whoops, I changed the slide. Um, so, as Ben mentioned, we've been trying to um, work with the other historical societies and not just so much live in our silos. And so I wanted to create an exhibit that we could share across the county, not just at our museums, but also at our public libraries and so forth, that would, would kind of share some of the common history we have. And so that's how this was born with the support of our sponsors. I'll get it, Cindy. Okay, so this is an 1857 plat of Douglas County. And at that time, there were only four different townships. And the Grant Township north of the river was not part of the county. And this, you don't have to really see the good focus detail, but you can tell the county's very sparsely populated by 1857. A little background on um, census data from 1860 to 1870. There's a significant increase in population into Douglas County um, from 8,637 to 20,592. Okay, so that's significant. If you think about how people are coming, they're coming the hard way. They're coming on horseback and wagon. <laughs> okay, and then growth is very, very <coughs> slow across several decades quite a few decades, until the impact of World War II. <coughs> so by 1865, who is here and where did they come from? 18% came directly from Europe. All kinds of languages were being spoken here. 23% from the New England states, like, like we think about who founded Lawrence and the, the immigrant aid companies that came and brought groups of people. But 29% of people migrated on west from the states of Ohio, Illinois, and Indiana, and 29% out of the upper south, Arkansas, and Missouri. So you have a real mixture of people coming together here by 1865. Cindy mentioned the immigrant aid company. This is Eli Fair, and um, he was the one who really um, spearheaded the immigrant aid companies for, for Kansas 
to make sure that Kansas would become a free um, state. So German immigration was huge. How many of you have some German ancestry? Okay, <laughs> it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Um, on the left, the Harper's Weekly illustration of the New World depicts German immigrants bound for New York embarking on the Hamburg steamer. Incessant wars, religious conflicts, political uh, grievances of all sorts, and just the absolute loss of hope in Germany um, inspired people to get on boats and leave in huge numbers. An estimated six million people left Germany from 1820 to 1920. A large portion of those people came to the United States. <laughs> on the right is the Turnhalle in um, Lawrence. And these were, this became the center of the German community. And these were formed all over um, where new settlement was formed. German, there are German settlements all over the area. You can probably name several. Um, but I just wanted to focus on one. And I should say that the exhibit has much more than I'm going to share with you tonight. So you should take your company that's coming for the holidays and go down and see Ben. Because um, the exhibit will be there through the end of the year. At Stull, uh, or the Emanuel Hill Cemetery on Deer Creek, um, this is um, a location west of Lawrence at the intersection of Old Highway 40 and U.S. Highway 10. Um, this was a German settlement. And here I am with um, Virginia Woolf Cole and Elsie Von Meyer Middleton um, looking, uh, walking through the cemetery, kind of assessing where we need to clean stones and what the history of the people are, so forth. Um, and on the right is the uh, church that now is, is there. It's the United Methodist Church. But a group of families came to the area west of Lawrence um, in the 1860s. Um, and um, by then they, had, they raised money and the land was donated by J Jacob Hildebrand. At a cost of $2,000 they built a church themselves. And this Deer Creek community later became known as Stull, named after their only postmaster, Sylvester Stull. Um, eventually they had a few stores, and there was supposed to be an inner urban line that would go through, but it never came. Um, but the surnames there are Bonmeyer, Wolfkull, Stull, Schneider, Roller, um, Camp Schroeder, Hildebrand, Herschel, Deister, and Buchheim, and I hope I pronounced those correctly, and among other names. The uh, church was demolished in 2002, sadly, and only the ruins remain. Down on the southern border of Douglas County, on the line to Franklin County, there was a little community that was formed in, south, in the southwest portion of the county there. It was the Appanoose community, and these um, settlers, Ashley um, came. He was a Confederate soldier who served in the war. His name was Daniel Barnhart, and he decided to come north after the war, and he became a brethren pastor in that community, and his descendants still live in the area, and you, the brethren church is a peace church. So it's a very interesting transformation. Um, this church is now privately owned, and the cemetery is across the road. And both of these were just recently listed on the National Register of Historic Places for Kansas. The Bloomington Town Share, out by Clinton, um, the Bloomington Town Company was promoted for settlement in the 1850s. The town was located eight miles up the Wakarusa River. Um, early settlers were strong anti-slavery advocates, and some of them had been murdered by the Missourians who wanted Kansas to become a slave state. The area w became the home to many of the members of the First Kansas Colored uh, Volunteer Infantry, which was the first black unit to see service in the Civil War. And here's one of the locals, the George Washington family in Bloomington. Um, he was actually um, born on a slavery, on a plantation in Virginia, 
um, and um, owned by John Washington and Mary Grant. And George was actually given as a wedding gift to the slave owner's daughter <coughs> and brought to Missouri. In 1862, he escaped by crossing the frozen Missouri River, and he got um, help from abolitionists. He went to Leavenworth, and he joined up to serve in the Civil War. And after the war, he came back to Bloomington. He came to Bloomington and owned um, a farm and raised this huge family. He was a leader in the church. He was a leader in elections. He held Fourth of July picnics on his farm to invited many, many people. Um, to his property um, to celebrate freedom. Another African-American story in Douglas County was along the old oxbow of the uh, Kansas River, and that part of it remains. This area be, you would know as Lakeview. Do, are you familiar with this area? Um, Langston Hughes's grandparents had a farm out here in this area. But recently, I was able to contact um, the Lewis family, um, a descendant in Denver, and he told me this story. In 1865, Joshua Lewis, his mother, and three of his siblings departed a plantation in Kentucky, and they went north to Hillsboro, Ohio, where Joshua met and married Mary Dent, who's in the buggy. In the 1870s, flyers beckoned African Americans to come to Kansas for five dollars. So the family joined the movement and came. At that time, Lawrence had a reputation of being a safe place for African Americans to come and live, to farm, to raise their families. And he was hired by the Emmett Farm uh, family and then was able to save money to acquire 50 acres and had, he had orchards on his farm and he was allowed to join the Lakeview Hunting Club at that time. As the community grew, a church was built and the land was donated, um, a land, land was donated for an African American cemetery, which is totally landlocked today, but it's still at the, on the bo eastern border of Lecompton Township, um, where many African Americans from his family are buried. Mary lived to be 95, and the family stories say that she would saddle up her own horse and deliver eggs, vegetables, and fruit apples, pears, peaches, plums, and cherries to the local grocery stores. On their 50-acre farm, they produced apple butter and apple cider, and they raised stock and had cows, and Grandpa went fishing and at Lakeview and duck hunting, and Grandma made feather ticks for their beds. And one son, they had 12 children, one drowned at Lakeview while ice skating. So their descendants live in Denver today. The Harvey family, you may be familiar with this story. This is a Blue Mound story. The Harveys um, escaped slavery in Arkansas and came to Douglas County with a hundred other former slaves under the watch of General James Blunt. The Harvey family began farming and over time purchased 300 acres of land near Blue Mound. Their descendants are still in the area today. All three sons were graduates of KU, and uh, this is... Um, Sherman Harvey, he ran for Douglas County clerk and won, even though J.B. Watkins, the banker that you may be familiar with, he said a vote for Sherman Harvey is a vote for Negro domination. And that was the, that was the story published in the local newspapers. But the Harvey family had lots of support, and so they persevered successfully. According to the census data, um, African Americans uh, found work. Many of them worked in the quarries, doing hard labor, cutting a lot of the stone for the homes, the barns, the buildings, the foundations, many of which still stand today. They built a lot of the stone fences around the farm country. That was hard work, uh, but they were glad to have. They were glad to have that work. They were teamsters, janitors, domestics. They became farmers and horticulturalists. But by 1900, racial segregation was evident in schools and in other public spaces. So we'll move on to Lecompton. This is an example of political migration. Lecompton used to be a uh, very large, uh, busy place, <laughs> shall we say. In 1855, a pro-slavery Kansas territorial legislature 
designated Lecompton as the territorial capital, and in the rush of immigrants streaming into the territory and to the new capital were advocates determined to decide free state or pro-slavery Kansas. Others came without political motives, however, just seeking quality farmland and business opportunities that came with the new territory. This is us. Um, some of the examples of built environment, we go around the county um, and do survey work for the Heritage Conservation Council for Douglas County. And these are examples of buildings that were built by Italian immigrants who came to the Lecompton area as stone masons. You may um, recognize the Taylor Barn on the left, the Territorial Capital Museum, and also the Migliori, Migliario brothers um, built uh, their own large homestead uh, with several standing buildings yet that um, we hope will soon be on the National Register as well. So all the way from Italy. And one topic that I think is really important too is Mexican immigration. The Mexican presence in Kansas is older than the state itself. Tex um, Mexicans traveled the Santa Fe Trail while transporting goods and passed through the area on cattle drives. From 1900 to 1930, the Mexican Revolution caused economic hardship for rural Mexicans and created opportunities for the Santa Fe Railroad who needed workers. Thousands came to work and live in towns along the Santa Fe line. Over one million immigrants immigrated to the U.S. during this time period. That's an amazing number. This 1884 map includes an inset map in the upper right corner that shows the lines of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway and its connections to the Mexican railways. The majority of the workers who migrated to Douglas County were from Veracruz and um, Mexico City. Here's a local picture that um, came from Tammy Silva, who's a descendant of some of the Baldwin City uh, people um, working on a local line. You could say the railroads were built on the backs of Mexican immigrants, literally. La Yarda, have you heard this story? Mexican families came to Lawrence to work on the Santa Fe Railway. Um, in the 1920s, um, they were housed either in boxcars, or in humble settlements known as the La Yarda, located east of the railroad tracks in East Lawrence. And that was, they were in, these were uh, brick block, concrete block um, housing units along the river. They wanted to house families um, over the winter so their workers would leave every year and go back to Mexico. But the 1951 flood totally wiped the La Yarda out, as it did many other places along, but especially this settlement. Descendants um, from the La Yarda folks still live in Lawrence and in Douglas County, and they celebrate their cultural heritage at the St. John's Church annual Mexican fiesta known as La Fiesta. So, I'm going to stop there because I don't want to give it all away. <laughs> uh, but there are many reasons why people came um, to Douglas County. And uh, one of the goals of this project was to try to gather more stories from around the county, the untold stories, um, so we can do a better job interpreting that your story of Eudora, the story of Douglas County in the future. Um, Yeah. Okay. You're right. Yeah. Pull up my uh, PowerPoint here.
Can I have the clicker that you... I'm sorry? The, the clicker? Yeah, you have that. I don't know if that will work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. I don't even... So, did you bring this, Cindy? I don't think Cindy did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I had a. I was going to say you were back. Cindy and Jan have already kind of outlined some of the immigrant groups I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to talk about immigration more specifically to the Eudora area. And there are six different groups that I'm going to um, discuss in this presentation. And the, uh, predictably, the first group are the uh, Shawnee Indians of Northeast Kansas. And as Cindy mentioned, in 1830, a lot of the uh, native tribes still in east of the Mississippi River were forced into places like Kansas and the Shawnees were the ones that were settled uh, in this area. And uh, the Shawnees developed farms and they also traded with the American travelers on the Oregon Trail. And I have a direct quote from Cindy's book, her 2007 history book, which I think gives a very good uh, illustration of the Shawnee presence in the area. Uh, Wilson Hobbs, a doctor who lived with the Shawnees from 1850 to 1852 wrote, at the time of my residency with these people, there were very few full-blooded Indians among them. The Parkses, Joe and William, the Blue Jacket, Charles and Henry and George, the Fishes, Pascal and John, the most noted and influential men of the tribe were scarcely half-bloods, white predominating. Of the three Blue Jacket brothers, George had the most red blood and the least civilization. Not exactly politically correct. <laughs> um, next picture of Tentasquata. He was a very important Shawnee. Uh, member, and that's Charles Blue Jacket there. And I have this other direct quote from Cindy's book that I think is uh, pretty uh, insightful. This is a quote from Lieutenant J.W. Albert. He wrote about the Shawnee Indians here on June 29, 1846, in the river, the Kansas River. We found two large flatboats, or scows, manned by Shawnee Indians dressed in bright colored shirts with shawls around their heads. The current of the river was very rapid, so that it required the greatest exertion on the part of our, of our ferrymen to prevent the boats from being swept downstream. We landed just at the mouth of the Wakarusa Creek. Here there is no perceptible current. The creek is 14 feet deep, while the river does not average more than 5 feet deep. In some places, and is quite shallow, the pure cold water of the Wakarusa looks so inviting that some of us could not refrain from plunging beneath its crystal surface. Which, uh, if anyone's seen the Wakarusa River today, uh, it's not a very accurate description of the river. It's quite murky today. And the Shawnees had to endure the increasing presence of American settlers uh, in the 1840s and 1850s. The Oregon Trail was a very common route that swept right through the heart of the Shawnee land. And of course, in 1850, the Wakarusa mission was opened by the Still family, by Abraham Still, which was in operation for about four years and served the local Shawnee Indians. And uh, Eudora was among the last areas in Douglas County to be settled by European Americans. <coughs> it was in the middle of Bleeding Kansas that Eudora was founded by a German immigrant company, company as Cindy had mentioned. The uh, immigrants that settled Eudora had purchased the land from Shawnee Chief Pascal Fish, which I have never seen a picture of Pasco fish. I, I don't know if one even exists. If I could have one thing that I could find, it would be a picture of Pasco fish. We have a picture of Leander fish, and we have a picture of Eudora fish. We actually have that in the museum, but I have never seen a picture of Pasco fish, and I've really, really looked very hard, but um, maybe one day we'll find one. And um, as was mentioned, Eudora was settled in the middle of uh, Bleeding Kansas. Early Eudora residents were by and large considered moderate free staters when it came to the issue of slavery. They were really neither pro-slavery, pro-slave, they, they were not on the pro-slavery side nor were they abolitionists. Uh, this is another uh, direct quote from Cindy's book. The Eudora Town Company gave the settlers $4,000 for buildings, furniture, six yoke of oxen, and mills for corn, grain, and lumber under the administration of Charles Durr and Samuel A. Johnson 
party left Chicago and arrived at their destination April 18, 1857. They settled near the Kansas River in the Wakarusa River by the north side of the present Main Street. The settlers built an 18-foot by 20-foot log cabin on a site directly behind or east of 714 Main Street, where they shared for a while. <coughs> 714 Main is directly north, north of our uh, museum building. Said David Katzman, a KU professor, in a June 17, 1979 Lawrence Journal World article, the town was founded by German immigrants, many of whom had left after the Revolution of 1848. They were called 48ers. Several in the group, such as Summerfield and Cohen, were Jewish. Katzman said they probably viewed their stay in the U.S. as temporary and sought a German community. The Jewish arrival in Eudora makes the city the second oldest Jewish community in Kansas, Leavenworth being the oldest. Uh, in 1859, of the 29 households in the city, seven were Jewish. With the birth of several children, by 1863, Eudora had 50 Jewish citizens. And um, Eudora did become a fast-growing community in the 1860s and 70s, and throughout the second half of the 19th century. And really, it did retain a very strong German identity until well into the 20th century. For instance, we know that beer was very popular in Eudora, even while um, it was the temperance movement was gaining popularity elsewhere in Kansas. And um, these are just some of the early businesses in Eudora. And we just got this donated to the museum not too long ago. Uh, it's uh, a trunk by uh, A.F. Durr. I, uh, Tim Shepard brought us it. It was from, I think, Alvin Durr's estate sale from quite a while ago. And those are just some of the original settlers there as well. And then, um, so we know we have the brewery here. And then another very uh, prominent symbol of the German culture here was the Turner Hall, which was located at 623 Church Street in Eudora. And um, they were popular, and they were a way for a lot of Germans to keep in touch with their identity and their culture. And um, they could be used for a variety of purposes, but they could also be used for gymnastic and exercise activities. The very first president of the Turner Hall here was John Siebold. John was the person who built our museum building. In 18, starting in 1869, uh, John had a wife and six kids, and he was the uh, he was a tinsmith, and um, he died at the age of 39, though very sadly. And um, Eudora did have a prominent Jewish community; uh, they were German Jews that settled here. And um, as as was said, some of the more prominent people in Eudora were Jewish. One of them was Asher Cohen, who we have a picture of right there. He was the operator of Eudora's general store at 714 Main Street, which was a successful business. And the most prominent remnant of our Jewish community is the Benny Israel Cemetery, which uh, is on the National Register now. And our organization had a lot to do with getting it on the state register. So I think it's one of the finer things we've done. And um, really, today, there's hardly any of that Jewish community left. Most of them had moved on. Uh, by 1900, there was really no Jewish presence after for several decades here. Uh, one group that came here were the Quakers who settled in Hesper. They came to the Eudora area in the 1850s, and Hesper is of course just two miles south of Eudora. And uh, the Hesper Friends Church is still standing today as a prominent reminder of that community. At Hesper's peak in the 1870s, the community had a post office, a general store, a library, and a school. Several notable people grew up in Hesper, including John Outland, who played and coached football at KU, and is the namesake of the prestigious Outland Award for college football players. Walter Stubbs, who was governor of Kansas from 1909 to 1913, grew up in Hesper, and James Davis, the founder of Friends University in Wichita, is also from Hesper. In 1884, the Hesper Academy opened and was the first high school in the Eudora area. It closed in 1912 after the Eudora High School opened. And um, really, the community today is just a few houses, but it's one of the more substantial ghost towns in the Eudora area compared to Weaver and Clearfield, places like that. And then another very large group that settled Eudora were African Americans. Um, a very large community of African Americans lived here in the 1860s and 70s. About 25% of all Eudora area residents were black in 1865. And uh, many of them who moved to the area were former slaves from Missouri and other southern states. 
And uh, as the Civil War began, many towns in Northeast Kansas, including Eudora, became a major destination for African American migration. Census records um, from 1865 indicated 250 residents. Uh, it remained steady until the 1880s and then gradually declined thereafter. Uh, today, less than 1% of Eudora is black. Uh, community relations formed as African Americans in Eudora lived together, worked together, built churches, and sent their children to school. While, the, while they created community ties, Eudora was not segregated to um, the extent that nearby communities of Lawrence and Topeka in Kansas City were. Here's some black residents from Eudora. And here's an example of an integrated class in Eudora from 1896. And um, churches were extremely important. And uh, Eudora had three different black churches throughout its history. I think this one was on Locust Street, and it was uh, demolished in the 1980s. And the one on the far side was is still there at 610 Kirk Street. And today it's a private residence. And um, the goal of African Americans in Eudora was to begin working to support their own families. The majority of the incoming African Americans did not have enough money to start their own farms. Many were hired on as wage workers for local white farmers, although seasonal farm labor was a large source of employment. Other job opportunities included carpentry, masonry, digging wells, coal mining, and laboring at businesses. Women, women found work both inside the home and doing domestic work for others. While men could find work outside of the home, black women did not have those same opportunities. Some would become the black community's midwives, others would be domestic help for white families. Cleaning, cooking, ironing, running errands, and childcare were all expected of domestic workers. Uh, African American women not only did this for the local white families, but then again repeated that work at their own house. By the 1920s, 81% of black women in Kansas were employed in domestic work. Even African American children were expected to work. Black children found work at local schools which helped them become more integrated with their white classmates. And, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, the, the churches were, as I said, were extremely important. They were more than just religious purposes. It was kind of a cultural force in the lives of many of Eudora's African Americans. And it provided them opportunities for learning, reading, engaging in music lessons, and developing um, other social and leadership skills. Eudora, like many other towns in Kansas, was home to members of the Ku Klux Klan. When the KKK experienced a revival in the 1920s, Lawrence newspapers noted multiple Klan meetings in Lawrence and the surrounding areas throughout the decade. By 1924, there were 100,000 Klan members in the state. The goal of the KKK was to intimidate and bring fear to minority groups, including African Americans, Catholics, and Jews, through violent acts. Eudora's Klan activity primarily focused uh, attacks on the Catholic community. And this is whoops, allegedly a KKK float that was in the CPA parade in the 1920s. The Southwest Cemetery in Eudora at 15th and Cedar Streets is the resting place of many of Eudora's early black residents. The Southwest Cemetery is basically the only really visible reminder of Eudora's black community. Uh, it was started in 1857, and it was the city's cemetery. However, in 1867, the city of Eudora purchased land just east of town on 7th Street, and that became the modern cemetery that is still used today. So in essence, what happened is that the cemeteries became segregated in 1867, and white people were buried at the new one, and black people were buried at this one. Uh, today the cemetery is in kind of rough shape, but um, maybe that's something we can look at revitalizing in the future. And we do have that tombstone in our museum collection for Isabel Johnson. And um, that was just cleaned up earlier this year at a workshop that Jan hosted, that Stephanie cleaned up. So it's a little more legible now. That was found on Doc Holliday's property, just next to the Black Cemetery. And that's now on display in our museum. Uh, Eudora's African Americans endured numerous challenges as they settled in the area, uh, but without their influence, Eudora would not be the town that it is today. 
They struggle to create better lives for themselves, their families, working as farmers and domestic servants, carpenters and laborers. Uh, Eudora's African Americans attended schools, built churches, and created a community that has forever enriched the community. And though many left in search of opportunities elsewhere, uh, their impact is still felt here today. And just to go back to the first one there, that's pretty consistent with the Great Migration, where a lot of rural African Americans left the country starting in the 1920s, and they left for urban cities like Detroit, Philadelphia, and Kansas City uh, for search of better employment. And then the last group I'm going to talk about are the Arkies from Arkansas. And um, they um, came here in the early 1940s at the same time the Sunflower Army and Ammunition Plant opened up, which created 12,000 new jobs. And that created a tremendous housing shortage in Eudora. And the population uh, basically doubled very quickly. And um, the plant was in operation on and off until about 1992. And um, one very important person that came during this migration was our Vice President, Benny Dean. And um, very thankful that he came here at that time in the 1940s because without his work, we might not even have a museum today. So he's uh, a very important part of Eudora's migration history. And um, so that's really all I have. And I think what I'd like to do now is I'll show you some of the immigration artifacts that I brought. Does anyone know what this is? Yeah. This was a trowel. It was used in the construction of the Salem Chapel. And um, it was owned by a man named John Scholz. And he brought this from Germany. And I think this was on display at the Salem Chapel for a long time. And it's been in our museum for quite a while. What's this? No. Nope. Nope. Exercise. Exercise pin. This is from Eudora's Turner Hall. So this is one of the items that the men there would have been juggling with. What's that called? <laughs> What's the name of that thing? Uh, I don't remember. It's got a name. Yeah. This? Yeah. I just call it an exercise pin. <laughs> it's got a name. I don't remember what it is. This uh, was just brought in recently by um, Zach Stahl. This was uncovered near Blue Jackets Crossing. It's a mule shoe. So this is a remnant of some of the immigrants that passed through Eudora on their way to western parts of the country. These are just some books in German that were given to the museum over the years. And then this is a copy of the very important document that started Eudora, which we have uh, in our collection at the museum. The deed that started Eudora were Pascal Fish signed over his land to the German immigrant company. Charles Durr signed the document. And uh, so it was essentially one immigrant signing over this land to another immigrant group. And um, if anyone here has their own stories to tell about their family or personal immigration stories, if anyone bought artifacts or pictures or documents, I'd invite you to, to come up and share with the group now. As Jan said, we want to um, find new stories that haven't been told yet. So if anyone's got any stories to tell, please uh, feel free to come up here. I don't, I don't have that, but a question. Where was the Wakarusa mission? The still... I, it was, I, I, I read that it was about 12th and Elm Street. That's where it was. Um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you where. And how about the Turner? That's still there. That's at 623 Church Street. It's a private residence today. Somebody brought something down here. Somebody bring? Did you bring something? Oh, well, I have something I want to share. Yeah. <laughs> um, I um, was fortunate to go to Germany um, two years ago and met up, met up with Reinhold Hofer, who did the video that's posted on the our website. And we were in the Granite Valley, which is, I think, where most of uh, the, or the Germans came from that settled in Eudora. 
And he took us to this little, we were in the middle of nowhere, um, and he kept saying, you want to see this museum? He wants, he wants us to see this museum. And actually, it was a museum above a little restaurant. And so we went in, went upstairs, and on the wall was this map. And it was probably six feet wide, showing where everyone in that area immigrated to. Mm -hmm. And predominantly, right in the middle is Eudora. Oh, wow. Oh, that was kind of cool. Very good. Mm -hmm. And then I did bring a picture. This is not really to do with immigration, but just a favorite that Le that Leonard um, bought off the internet and gave to me. This is um, no, okay. from uh, it's from 18, 1890, and it's taken in front of the the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was built in in three parts. The back part in 1864, and you can see where the masonry changes very distinctly. And so this is before the front part was added and the door was there. And there are about 15 girls here and the priest is standing pretty far from them. And there's a, a banner on the back and it um, uh, says, the Young Virgins Club. The <laughs> <laughs> Young Virgins Society. Oh, I'll pass it around. But I'm very proud my grandmother's in here, but I don't know which one she we do have the original of that in the museum. It was one of the many things Leonard Hallman purchased before he uh, passed away and donated to our museum. All right, well, I want to thank Cindy and Jan for coming here. I think they did a... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yes, 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 My name is Michael Schoper. Yes. Um, I looked up some of my relative information. It's really interesting. Uh, I had no idea that my great-great-grandfather, Michael, <laughs> he uh, came to the United States in around 1868. Um, and he brought with him my great-grandfather, Joseph, um, and two of his sisters. So they all emigrated over. They settled in Clearfield, Kansas, uh, eventually about 1900s, early 1900s, 1903, something like that. They um, settled uh, just west of Eudora, around by the Wakarusa. In fact, uh, I think it was shortly after that, they acquired the farm, which is still in our family today, which is on uh, just the outskirts of Eudora there. I call it Old K-10, before you get to the Wakarusa River. Uh, the outdoor bowling alley, which I believe you've got some information from. Uh, there's an outdoor bowling pin and balls that uh, the outdoor bowling alley is still on the property. Uh, the remnants of it, you can still see the concrete abutments where they put the uh, bowling alley. So it's kind of cool. Uh, the other cool part, the really cool part, is on the property there. Uh, it's a hillside right above the, where the bowling alley was. And in the hillside is a cave. We always thought it was a natural cave, but we found out later that it was, no, it was dug out from the sandstone hillside. And that's where the uh, Germans uh, that were playing bowling would cool their beer. <laughs> <laughs> so, very resourceful. But as I was going through some stuff, um, my great-great-grandfather that came over when he was 12 uh, didn't actually become a naturalized citizen until, he, well, until 1921. So he came over in the early 60s, but he didn't, 1860s, but he didn't, uh, didn't become a naturalized citizen. And um, my, I can show you this. It was around, I guess around World War I, around the 19, 1918. He had to register in Eudora as a alien enemy. So they fingerprinted him. Uh, this is a document that shows where he came from, that he came over in 1872. Um, but so this was, he didn't, this was in 1918. He still didn't become a naturalized citizen until 21. So, but he was able to buy land, but have a farm and everything else. So um, that's one thing if anybody wants to see what those things were like. Um, the other thing that's interesting is you talk about the trunk, and I've been trying to get with Ben, and I think eventually we will hook up um, if I can find this picture. That is a trunk that has my great-great-grandfather's name on it. He was Michael. But he spelled it, I believe, the way he pronounced it, which is Mihael. So M-I-H-A-E-L. And our last name is S-C-H-O-P-P-E-R. He spelled it S-C-O-P-E-R, which I think is pronounced Soper. 
Um, but whether this was his immigrant trunk, I do not know. Um, but it is a really interesting and old trunk. And um, at some point, I'd like to donate it to the museum if the museum will have it. Um, so if you want to see that too, that's uh, here. So there's, the more and more I got involved in this, the more and more I realized, my gosh, there's so much history here. Uh, there really is. And we, I knew the Walker Brusa River when it was a creek. <laughs> so it's um, really interesting to see how things evolve and how things go. But I'm just really excited to be part of this. I also, speaking of citizenship, I brought my great-grandfather's um, citizenship certificate. And he came in 1867, same year, from the same place. Yeah. And um, he didn't become a citizen until 1888. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wonder about that, too. <laughs> uh, my name is Rick Zizimus, and um, one of our ancestors, August, was one of the first members of the uh, founding fathers that came here, and uh, we've been we've been attached to you door from day one. And I've got a bunch of family pictures, uh, old pictures, and some other information that I'll put on the table back there if anybody wants to take a look at. Them. Thank you. Thanks for reading that. City Hall across the street, like at Seventh and Main, but just one block over to the to the east, right there on that where the hotel is, or the yeah, spa. Yeah, I I think so. That's what I just read from Cindy's book. Yeah, that's what I, I so. had thought. I, I think that was about the first area of settlement. Yeah, and that could have been a farmstead. Lutz property. Yeah. Do you know where I'm talking about? I know where the Lutz Holtz uh -huh. property is. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where uh, Pastor Fisher's Ferry.
like to thank our three speakers tonight. And we adjourn. Hope you come back again in January. <laughs>